Hello and welcome to Data Security for Contact Centers, Leveraging Cloud Technologies presented by Echo. I'm your host today, Mike Bizard, and we have a couple of housekeeping activities to go through first. I would like to call your attention to the Q&A button on your screen. We encourage you to participate and ask questions. Secondarily, those who remain to the end of the session will be eligible to win four $25 Amazon gift cards. Our speaker today is Justin Crawford. He is Vice President of Engineering and Technology for ECHO. He started in the telecom and contact center industry over 20 years ago as a developer and an engineer. He's had experience with Cisco, Avaya, Genesis, and has developed solutions for many Fortune 500 companies, as well as a few Fortune 15 companies. With this unique blend of telephony and integration and application development experience, Justin is a great asset for managing complex projects where all these elements come together. Justin, welcome to the event and take it away. Great, thank you. And welcome everybody. Thank you for attending today. I uh, wanted to spend a few minutes uh, going over uh, some ideas with you guys about uh, how we deal with data security in the contact centers uh, with this advent of uh, everything going on with cloud. You know, as we've all been uh, seen with COVID-19, um, it's had a tremendous impact on the way the organizations that we all uh, work for are doing business. There's a massive amounts of people have shifted to a work from home model, um, which is really increasing the demand for cloud applications, video conferencing and, and the like. Uh, but this growth really started uh, back in 2010. So back in 2010, uh, we've seen since then, the growth has been uh, from about 24 billion annually to over 265 billion annually, um, which is the projected estimate for the end of this year. And 60% of most of the enterprise infrastructure that's out there today uh, has made its way to the cloud. 81% uh, of enterprises are in the process of some form of cloud adoption. So we're really seeing a, a big uptick in, in cloud adoption, and we've, we've seen that with our customer base as well. If you think about it, you know, the average person is using over 35 cloud-based services every day from, from personal things like checking social media and, and the like, as well as, uh, you know, within their professional life. Uh, you know, we all see Microsoft 365 and uh, Zoom meetings and, and all those kind of things. Um, we're expecting over 50 trillion gigabytes or 50 zettabytes per year of data passing through uh, cloud infrastructure um, by the end of 2020. So it's just a massive amount of data and services being provided uh, within the cloud. From a, uh, a, June, a June 2020 uh, Security Magazine study, uh, found that nearly 80% of companies surveyed um, had experienced at least uh, one cloud data breach within the last 18 months. Um, you know, some of these uh, access uh, security challenges um, deal with, you know, in insufficient uh, personnel and expertise. Um, you know, the cloud organizations are doing their best to keep up, but uh, there's a lot that they're dealing with as well. And, you know, as we all know, uh, you know, your security is is really just meant to slow people down. It's, at the end of the day, there are certain people, they're gonna find a way to get in um, if they really want in. So we're trying our best to prevent uh, as much as we can, but there isn't uh, you know, a completely 100% foolproof way of, of doing that. Um, you know, of those companies, 43% reported more than 10 data breaches in that period. Um, and 19% of those breaches, as I kind of talked about, are caused by some form of a misconfiguration in the cloud. Um, and those breaches are, are cost an average of uh, 4.27 million. Um, so how do we how do we deal with that? As we all are looking at ways of of moving things to the cloud and you know work at home and all that, um, part of that is adopting a zero trust security model. Um, just making sure that uh, just because a cloud provider tells you that they're secure, just because somebody says they are who they are, um, we need other ways of verifying that. Um, we also need to perform stress tests on our incident response plans. Uh, so when there is a security incident, have we 
do we really know and does everybody within the organization know what their role is and how to respond to, to those types of incidents? Um, you want to minimize the complexity of your IT systems. The less touch points data has to flow through, the less places uh, that you have available for somebody to uh, find a way in or to exploit something. Um, identity access management is key. Uh, make sure we know, you know who people are and that they are who they say they are. Um, and ensuring the third-party solutions you're using in these cloud providers are, are, are aligning with your security standards and, and align with the security posture um, of, of your company. So what do we look for when we look at a solution like this? Well, uh, one of the key things that you know we, we at Echo focus on is there's a lot of different standards out there from PCI DSS to HIPAA, um, we see a lot of the privacy laws coming on board and that kind of stuff, but compliant doesn't always equal secure. Uh, many companies that experience a, a breach, I, in fact, I would say almost every one of them that have experienced a breach were in compliance. Um, you know, you think of, uh, of some of these companies that experienced credit card breaches, and most of them were, were compliant with PCI DSS, um, had passed their annual audits and, and so forth, um, but there were still uh, a breach that happened. So compliant does, isn't the last step in, in your security posture. Obviously, you need to be compliant, but you can't be compliant and then just say, okay, I'm compliant, I'm, I'm ready to move on. What you want to do is try to avoid uh, having as much of the data in your environment as you can. If the data is not there, it can't be stolen, right? So minimize where data is stored, processed, or transmitted through your environment and really take a hard look at does that data really need to be there? Um, does it really need to uh, be stored or processed or transmitted through that? When you're looking at your cloud solutions, you also have to look at from a cloud solution provider, a lot of these cloud solution providers will you know, provide a certain level of security. Um, and they will tell you that they're compliant and they're secure. But what happens when the data leaves the cloud? So you access that cloud service or your uh, employees or agents or whatever are accessing that service and they're retrieving a certain amount of information and some of that information may be protected or sensitive data. What happens when that data leaves the cloud? Cloud provider has secured it within their environment up to their edge. Uh, <clears throat> but what happens when it leaves the cloud? Uh, cloud providers being compliant and that if we're being honest, that serves to protect them more than it does to protect you. They're, they're doing that to make sure that they're not exposed to any liabilities for breach or that kind of thing. Um, it doesn't mean that it completely translates to security for you. So what happens to that data as it leaves their cloud? Uh, how does your team handle the data that, that you access through the cloud? So are, are there areas where that data is being pulled down from the cloud and then stored locally somewhere? Uh, are the ways in which it's being transmitted properly encrypted? Um, and again, like I said, do you really need access to that data, um, the, the underlying data that, that's there? Is there other means you could use to, uh, to perform the duty that you're trying to do without accessing the data directly? And what is your responsibility for protecting the data that you do have access to? I, I brought up things like PCI DSS for, uh, credit card data, um, we've got HIPAA and all the privacy laws um, and more and more coming on board. And as we see this you know, push towards cloud, I think we're gonna continue to see even broader um, uh, regulations and restrictions with that. You know, We've seen out of Europe, the GDPR things, and we see how with California and others, that's starting to, to take hold here in the US. Um, so what is your responsibility there to protect that data? So as we look at those kind of questions, um, look for s solutions that allow you to uh, minimize that data. Um, there's different kinds of ways of doing this. Some of that is just simply through masking the data. Um, if you think about things like social security numbers, you don't need the full social security number necessarily uh, to validate somebody's identity. Maybe you just need the last four. Um, for credit card data, tokenization, um, 
of that data provides a, a good way of being able to have uh, payment data within your environment that is is not the actual credit card number and therefore um, you know if somebody gets a hold of it it's really not of much use to them because it's it's just a token it's not the actual card and they can't take it and run with it um, so there's all sorts of this PII data that we want to look at and say you know do we really need that in our environment are there ways we could tokenize it are there ways we could mask it um, uh, and make sure that you know uh, that that we're handling it properly um, and being careful with with our customers' data, because um, we're all customers of somewhere, and we would want uh, the same treatment there uh, from from the companies we uh, do business with to make sure that they're handling it appropriately. So within Echo. We have the ability um, through some of our products uh, to secure data, uh, any type of PII data um, through the various channels like we talked about in the contact center, um, through voice or chat, and even uh, enabling e-wallet type payments uh, through Google Pay, Apple Pay, PayPal. Um, as I talked about, uh, you know, one of the primary ways of doing that is, is by tokenization. Um, so in this way, uh, preventing that data from flowing, um, in some cases, even into a cloud provider's environment, but certainly into, you know, the end contact center environment um, and protecting the company, protecting the customers that are interacting with those companies, keeping their data safe, while at the same time uh, being able to use the data for its intended use um, for PII, you know, identity, um, those kind of things, if we're looking at having to identify people via social security number or other identifiable information, um, processing uh, payments securely, uh, using a tokenization method, um, and and even further on that, what you know what we refer to as a temporary tokenization. So the the data is only there for the amount of time it needs to be there. Uh, so in certain cases. Um, you need to collect some information from a customer. Um, you need to provide a form of that to the agent to make sure it matches up or, you know, in the case of payments, being able to process a transaction. But once that's done, the actual data, the underlying data, like a credit card or data birth, social security number, uh, can, can go away and be replaced with, you know, a, something like a permanent token. Um, and in that way, uh, you're protected, the customer's protected, your cloud provider, if they, um, uh, depending on, you know, how you interoperate with them, uh, you may be in some ways protecting them as well so that uh, your data, as it flows through them, they're not even exposed to it. Um, and it ensures that you can take that sort of zero trust stance um, that you don't necessarily completely trust them with the data that's flowing through the environment and the cloud uh, environment that you're leveraging with them. So with that, uh, we kind of wanted to open this up for a discussion uh, among the folks that are here. Um, so have there been any questions logged so far? All right, well, let's jump into some questions. We're going to encourage everybody to ask some questions. But our first question goes to a subject that's on everybody's mind. It's working from home. So I guess people are looking for your opinion about if their agents are working from home now, are there any extra precautions they should be taking into consideration as they go into the new year? They do. Uh, working from home presents some, a lot of unique challenges. You don't have the physical environmental controls that you have within a traditional uh, brick and mortar uh, setup. And so the the data is flowing into um, essentially now a, a somewhat un uncontrolled environment um, where, uh, you know, you've got people using their own internet service, you know, VPNs are a great way to help uh, alle alleviate some of that concern. 
um, but it's not a foolproof. Um, you know, they've got a computer there that they have access to. Other people in the household may have access to, uh, you know, people, uh, delivery people, that kind of stuff um, are seeing things on screens that maybe wouldn't normally be seen. Um, so again, this just kind of goes back to if you don't need the actual data, don't need to see the actual data, you know, look for ways to uh, tokenize, um, mask, those types of things, that data, and limit the uh, the exposure of the data uh, to to the folks working at home. Um, there's a there's a number of, of ways to do that with with tokenization and masking. Well, let me ask you a follow up to that. How difficult is it to do that masking and tokenization work, and why don't more people do it? That, that's a really good. That's an interesting question. Um, it, it's it's not terribly difficult. Um, what has to happen is you need some form of, uh, for lack of a better term, a wrapper around the environment. So something to catch the data before it enters the environment, um, then provide the masking or tokenization. But then on the other side, when it needs to go out to some third party, if, if so if I'm thinking of a payment, uh, you know, we catch it when the customer provides it, and then we have to on the other end, when uh, when it's submitted to the bank or the payment processor for processing, uh, catch it there and give those entities the actual data um, that they need. So a payment processor is going to need a real credit card number. Um, so that putting a wrapper around your environment is the way to do that. Um, and there's there's a lot of companies that are starting to catch on to this. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, you know, we we've seen. Uh, we saw a quicker adoption of this um, probably out of Europe over the last several years. Uh, US was trailing a little bit behind that. We saw the same thing with things like the EMV on the on the pin pads with the credit cards, right? The chip and pin thing that was uh, you know more widespread in Europe before um, it hit the US. Um, so it is starting to pick up steam. I think companies are starting to see um, the value in, in protecting that information. Um, both from a risk avoidance, but also from, uh, you know, the security of their customers and their customers feeling good about doing business with them. What's the rate at which contact centers are moving into the cloud? It's not a trivial move per se, but I know that in the age of COVID, people are realizing that perhaps that on-premise data center isn't working out the way they thought. It's hard to have everybody dial in through a VPN. Do you think that this is going to accelerate as people have new budgets in 2021? We do, and we're we're starting to see that um, in some of the interactions we're having with our customers, um, both you know sort of on the sales side, uh, seeing more people asking about cloud solutions, and even on our existing uh, customer base asking about the potential to move to cloud. Um, I, I you know cloud's been there for a while. There's a lot of cloud providers out there. Um, I think you know we're really starting to see especially in the contact center space, that cloud infrastructure pick up steam. It does enable um, a lot of the things that we've talked about, like work from home agents and that kind of stuff. It makes those uh, situations a little easier to deal with when you've got a cloud-based uh, solution. But then it does also introduce its own uh, set of challenges, as we've talked about, um, with data flowing through those environments and then down into you know, a work at home agent or you know, a, a branch where you might have some agents working together. All right, we have another question here. Could you discuss methods and controls, tools for tokenization? Are there anything in specific that you would recommend to folks? So tokenization, especially in the, you know, if we talk specifically about the contact center, um, the, the methods that we're using to provide tokenization to our customers is really around the idea of having, especially with numeric data, um, callers enter that data uh, using their telephone keypad. Um, the key there is to not break the relationship between the agent and the caller, right? You want to maintain that. Customers want to speak to a real person. Um, and in the event that there's questions or challenges or whatever, they want somebody there that can help them through that. Um, by by leveraging some of the technologies that we have available to us today, uh, we can take that those digits that are entered by the customer on their phone, um, intercept them, 
through our service and provide the agent with a token. Um, and then the agent can use that token to proceed with the rest of, of the interaction with the customer. Um, and in that way, uh, protect themselves and the customer. This also enables things, um, you know, like uh, call recording, right? In the past, we've seen where um, lots of companies have tried to use call recording with pause and resume to uh, protect some of this because you obviously, there's the there's the part of the call where it's live and you've got that interaction, but then we've got the historical record in a call recording and making sure we're not storing things there. Uh, that tokenization really allows um, the ability for you to have a full end-to-end -end call recording from that. Um, the way in which we do tokenization, um, we have a proprietary uh, algorithm for our tokenization um, that, token, that can tokenize really any kind of data that we need to. Um, most popular has been payment data, but we can certainly do things like social security number, date of birth, and even some non-numeric stuff through speech recognition. All right, we have a follow-up question, but I think you just answered it with your own tool, but um, can you identify some best-in-class wrapper tools? I'm assuming that would be yours, right? <laughs> One of those would be ours. Um, Especially in the payment space, there are uh, token providers um, out there that provide uh, actual payment tokens. Um, the Echo solution kind of acts as a wrapper, um, and we sort of have our own proprietary tokens. But a true payment token, um, if you think about when you provide your card number to uh, your favorite cell phone company and you put it on your account, um, uh, what they're storing there as the card that they're hitting every month for like automated payments isn't typically your actual card number. It's typically a token and that's been provided by one of those token providers. Um, that's one method of doing it. Uh, but I think that only gets you kind of halfway there because you still have the issue of collecting the card initially and how did that happen? And did that card number make its way into an environment that you didn't want it in? So it's, um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little biased here. I think best in class for you know collecting that kind of information, especially over the phone. Um, I, you know, Echo is right up there. Um, it should, is you know, I think we are the market leader in that. And then one more question in a similar vein, but um, if the control methods are followed uh, external to internal, does that help people with insider threat issues as they occur? Can I? really map inside my organization who's accessing what that, that's always part of the challenge right um that's where i was saying you know compliance doesn't necessarily equal secure because compliance means i've got the data and i've tried to put as many controls around that data as i can to prevent unauthorized access but somebody somewhere has access um and so you know it, if you're, especially if you're storing the data um, on a long-term basis, um, you know, somebody somewhere has got access to that and, you know, uh, things like disgruntled employees or things like that. Um, it's, it's hard to prevent somebody who really wants in. Um, so you can put a lot of these controls around and yes, you can have alerts and things to let you know when somebody's done something they shouldn't. Um, in a lot of cases, the alerts are, a little bit late, they're kind of after the effect, after the fact, it tells you something happened. Um, and so at that point, you may have already been exposed. Uh, but as I said, you know, the more you can do things to not have the data in the first place um, it, it is better. And, you know, if you're gonna use a solution that, that provides, you know, a wrapper mentality that I've talked about, um, you know, you should also ask them about, you know, do they hold on to the data as well? You know, so the less less time that anybody involved in the transaction has the data, the less likely there is for somebody um, anywhere in the solution to to be able to access it and and potentially either uh, inadvertently uh, expose it or, you know, worst case scenario um, with nefarious intent. All right. The more data you have, the greater the responsibility. Is yeah. Our next question goes to um, a cloud provider has recommended that someone send um, a payment to the IVR. Do you have any insight on the effectiveness of that? Is that viable or even advisable? 
So it, it can be viable. Um, the problem with, with that generally, especially in a contact center environment, I, I lightly touched on this uh, previously, um, is really around a customer experience side of things. Um, we've seen in a lot of cases, especially when we're looking at organizations who um, you know, are trying to sell something, that when they transfer customers to an IVR uh, for collecting payment, um, people routinely abandon. We've even seen that, you know, we've had some interactions with uh, certain collection agencies um, as well. And even in those scenarios, customers tend to abandon um, the payment. So it, from a pure security standpoint, it can work. Um, it does go back to though, even with your cloud providers, kind of goes to my, my idea of a zero trust model. That removes the data out of your environment, but it puts it in the cloud, data, cloud provider's environment. And so you've shifted the responsibility away from you to the cloud provider for sure, but have you really protected the customer? Yeah, if, if the cloud provider's got the data and they're holding on to it, or you know, can you be really sure that they're not inadvertently putting it in logs, um, who with their environment has access to it, you kind of lose control of who has access to that data now um, versus you maintaining a level of control of that. So for a number of reasons, uh, you know, it it sort of works, but it's not what I would consider the, the best way to do it. You really want to keep that customer on the line, engaged with uh, with somebody from your company. You're maintaining control of uh, who has access to that data um, and that that data is never uh, there for very long. All right, we have another question going back to tokenization and implementation. Are there manual steps that need to be taken on the client side or any updates to a PCI DSS policy code that are automatically made through Echo? So with the Echo solution, um, because we're essentially taking that data out of your environment, um, it actually eliminates some of your scope from PCI DSS. So uh, you know, if, for those that might be familiar with something like a SAC D, um, you know, there's 250 some questions and you got to provide evidence based answers for those and that kind of stuff. Uh, with the echo solution, because we've removed that scope, um, we can take you down to about 10 questions or so actually forget how many are on a SAC A, but, um, but you essentially can become a SAC A in your contact center. Um, so it really just eliminates a lot of that work, um, a lot of those um, things that you have to do in a contact center. I mean, if, if we're really following PCI to the letter of the law, uh, you know, work at home becomes nearly impossible. It's not a clean room. You can't prevent people from bringing pen and paper, uh, video recording devices, any of that kind of stuff into their, into their home office, or if you can, it's incredibly difficult. Um, so it becomes really hard to enable things like work at home if you're taking payments without some sort of a solution um, that eliminates the data from reaching the agent. All right. Let me ask you another higher level question. Do you think we spend too much time worrying about securing the infrastructure and not enough time on the data? And it seems to be the data is the thing that winds up going missing most often. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's a perfect um perfect way of describing it. We do spend all this time looking at, you know, how we put firewalls and all this stuff around all these different pieces of infrastructure, but it truly is the data. Um, and the only true way of securing it, I, you know, I keep hitting this topic, but you're, the only way you're going to prevent somebody from uh, ever gaining access to it is to not have it in the first place. But it is truly about the data. Um, that's what consumers are concerned with giving out. Um, and it's what you know the thieves are most interested in getting. So it's really about uh, how do I minimize the amount of data that I actually need to be exposed to versus how can I you know, uh, build up my infrastructure to, to be Fort Knox for <laughs> lack of a better analogy. It seems like everywhere we turn these days, somebody's talking about machine learning algorithms and AI. So do you think that this will play a role in the future of securing data? And what might that look like in your ideal world? 
Yeah, um, we're actually, you know, from a roadmap perspective, we're actually already starting to look into ways that AI plays into this, um, both from our ability to provide security solutions, as well as developing a threat matrix for what those kind of, um, you know, AI and those kind of things would represent. Um, you know, as we think about, it, it goes back to what I said, um, and it's a theme I, I use with our customers often, which is, you know, it, it's an uncomfortable thing to say, but there is no 100% foolproof way to prevent uh, somebody from accessing something. We do a lot of things to make it as difficult as possible, but we see time and time again, people make their way in. Um, as AI becomes more and more prevalent, um, those AI systems are going to get even better at being able to to find the the vulnerabilities and find the ways in. So it just goes even more to uh, sort of the previous question of really focusing on the information that we're we're leveraging and where that information is, um, who needs access to it, and and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. Well, then let's take a giant step back for a minute. And what's your best advice to the audience here? Because it seems like there's a lot of things you have to consider, as you well pointed out. But where would you get started? What's the first thing to do? And then maybe what comes after that? Yeah, I think, you know, as you're looking for a, a cloud-based solution to address um, what you're doing, um, I do think that sometimes there is a natural propensity to say, uh, it kind of goes back to this infrastructure thing. If the infrastructure is not in my environment, then the security is not my problem anymore. Um, uh, you know, I'm oversimplifying there, but there we've seen some themes of that um, in talking to uh, talking to a lot of people. And really, that's that's the thing that you've got to be careful of. No, you don't have the infrastructure in your environment, but the information and the data typically is still coming in to your environment, to your organization. Um, to the people that work with them for you. Uh, and so how do you, you still have to have a focus on continuing to protect that. So as you look at these cloud solutions, um, engaging with a security partner to evaluate uh, how the cloud solution, as I talked about in the beginning, how are they handling the data? What happens to the data when it leaves the cloud provider on its way to you? What do you do with it? That kind of stuff. Having a good security uh, consultant that can come in um, and help you navigate that as you go through a selection process of a cloud provider uh, and help you see what uh, controls or uh, products can be uh, leveraged uh, together to make that the most secure uh, that you can for, like I said, you and your customer base. All right, great. Hey, Justin, thanks for sharing your insights. No problem. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, we're going to turn to our winners of the Amazon gift cards. They are Edward Z, JT, Ron K, and Andrew S. Congratulations. Check your email for those cards. Make sure you also check your spam filter because they could be in there. We think that this was a great presentation. I learned a lot. Happy to be here. And we encourage you to check out some of the other webinars on DevOps.com and some of our other sites. And thank you all for spending some time with us and have a great day and stay safe. Thank you, everybody.